I spit a lot, so I'm glad you guys chose to sit back a little bit. Um, so a lot of the writing that I'm going to read tonight centers around my family. Um, I grew up in a two-religion household. There was my mom, who was LDS, who um, I think I'm going to guess I'm going to take for granted that there's a little bit of LDS knowledge in this room, hopefully. And my dad, um, who's an Navajo, who had really shamanistic beliefs. Um, instead of, you know, you'd think that that kind of thing would be at odds with each other, but we got along really well. And it ended up being really complementary in some interesting ways and really dissonant in some, in some beautiful ways. Um, just like my mom's face, my dad's face carried some really uh, different ideas and, and different connotations. The Navajo uh, call themselves the Dina, uh, the people. And the implication behind that name is that um, other people who aren't Navajo aren't people. They're others, right? Um, and also, the Dina does not just mean the, the Navajo, but it also means the gods and the religion that surrounds them. And another example of that, um, when you look at Navajo language, it doesn't often translate literally into English. And so the way that my dad told me stories, there were assumptions and there were definitions that I didn't understand. And they really weren't structured like the stories that Americans are used to, right? You have the hero. Um, you look for that larger meaning or lesson that you can take out of parables and things like that. And not all of it really came to me that way. Um, they were really scattered. Sometimes they were weird or missing information. And when you compare those to the stories that came out of the Mormon culture, they were very different, very dissonant. And that taught me that maybe the world doesn't always have lessons or parables for you. Right? Sometimes the world just has beauty, or sometimes the world just has pain. Sometimes it's not easy to find the meaning, or sometimes the meaning is just your own. Um, and I think that's why poetry speaks to me the way it does. So I'm going to share some of my poetry that attempt to capture an ethereal thing, right? Um, after the fashion that my dad taught me. Um, and to start this, I want to um, start and end with two stories that he told me. Much of his culture has passed things on orally, so I'm going to. Uh, relate a few fables from that um, that he told me a lot of times and that I just the thing about them is they'd always change a little bit because he was doing them from memory and it wasn't about the details so much as the story itself. So the first story that I'd like to read is called The Fourth Body. It's a creation story. My father told me this story many times as far back as I can remember. Each time it changed a little but I found the change to be a good thing because good stories bend and take root in their listeners and change to solidify that. To the Navajo, the first of us rose up through three separate existences before finding this one. They left the other worlds behind through necessity. They'd been driven from each house because of infighting and adultery. They lived alone in each, in the dark, until they crawled into this world. Here they found other tribes and other people who lived as they did. When they arrived, the surface of this world was simply black and white under a blue sky. There was no sun no moon or stars, only four great snow-covered peaks lined the horizon in each of the cardinal directions. On cold nights, a booming voice echoed from each mountain. Late in the autumn, the voice grew nearer and revealed itself as a chorus. Four forms then came from the horizon, a body of white in the shape of a man, a body of blue, a watery form, a yellow body with a woman's figure, and a fourth body, the black body. The forms used no voice. At first, they tried to communicate with hands and gestures and were not understood. For four days, they came, and the people gained nothing. Finally, one of the gods remained and spoke to them, Black Body, the god of fire. He said that he wanted them to make people that were more like the gods. The people had bodies like the gods, but their teeth, their feet, and their claws were those of beasts. He told them to bathe themselves and prepare for his return. Black body returned after many months, and he brought the other. And he had brought the others. Blue body, the god of rain, stepped forward. A crescent moon glowing on his forehead, and stars glistening on his skin. He placed a buckskin on the ground and waited. White body, west wind, and god of all the world, came with two ears of corn: a yellow ear and a white ear. He placed the corn on the ground between the buckskins and put the feathers of eagles with them. 
Then they told the people to stand back, because the wind must enter. White body, the first man, and yellow body, the east wind and first woman, entered from either side. While the wind was blowing, other bodies came and circled the objects. When the dance was complete, the buckskin was removed. There were no ears of corn. There was fire, and man and woman had come into being. They married into the people, and the Navajo were born. It is said that the white ear of corn had become the man, and the yellow ear was transformed into the woman. The wind gave them life and still blows in and out of us now and gives us life. When this wind stills, so does our life. The black god then gave the din of fire and the dawn and left them to the wilderness. Growing up with my dad, um, he was a farmer. He came out of the, off the reservation to work <coughs> in railroads and he rode bulls and broncs and rodeos and he retired in Idaho. Um, and so we had a small farm, kind of a hobby farm, um, and he just had a few head of cattle, 20, 30, and we would spend our days tending them and, and working on the farm. Um, and I wanted to write about that. I've been exploring that in my poetry. And um, I tried to write a poem about one of my favorite cattle dogs that we had. Um, it's very hard to write about animals. This is called Spud. Dad named the dog after another dog from a beer commercial. Names weren't permanent for my dad. They changed as the christening changed. When the dog herded cattle in the valley, dad showed him how to move like a Navajo in a slow circle to keep the cattle together, in a quick dart, dart to drive them. The dog understood, but he was kicked once in the side by a young bull and rolled in the tall grass. Dad changed his name to 10 after 10 foot pull because he wouldn't hurt the cows after that. One time the cows broke through barbed wire into bloody freedom on the highway. Dad used his old Chevy to push them back. He threw it into gear and the truck lurched forward and hit a bump and the dog flipped out, spinning in the air like a pinwheel. Dad didn't bother stopping. He just yelled at the dog and drove out to the river. The dog was cartwheel for that day. For lunch, Dad would take blue corn flour and roll it into soft slabs of dough. The Navajo called it Kinish Bishi. Fed it to the dog, too. Then the dog was noodle nose. Once the dog leaped out of the truck and landed right on top of ch another dog chasing him. And then he was a fighter. Dad sewed him up and bought antibiotics, but for weeks he had a hobbled gait. His name became John Wayne. <laughs> Once towards the evening, Dad busted his knee tripping on some wire. He got an infection, went to the hospital, and told me he was proud of who I had become. The dog sat on the faded back porch looking through the dirty glass door at old rubber ditch boots and fencing tools. He didn't get a name that day, but if I'd thought about it, I'd have given him mine because we felt the same. A lot of time in Idaho I spent working, and for several summers I had a job on a farm, and my job was to really to kill things. I sprayed weed poison, I cut trees, and I maintained game birds. And um, I took a lot of that area for granted when I was young, and that, that job really helped me to come into um, a better understanding of that place. And so I explored that a little bit. This poem is called Russian Olives After the Tree. It's May, and the forest is taking over. Deep huddles of migrant trees, Russian olives, split concrete and snap barbed wire fences through fierce spurts of growth determined to make room for new sylvan heavens. In July, we ride into the backfield laden with gear for cutting and killing among new woods, intent on shoving back the thick, slow Russian march. Under summer's swelling ridge of heat, our blade work slows, bogged down in a morass of flies and swelter. Old stumps hidden in pastel grasses kick back at booted toes, leaving blood under the rubber. In August, we pile the branches, great declensions of once proudly heaped bark and trunk, leave us with little to show for our scratches and welts. How could we not have walked slowly to the November pyre, torpid from cold and lugging cans of gas? A breath of flame quickens into 40 feet of vertical ignescence, bright enough for God to speak through. Thermic gravity that slows cars on the distant highway, pulled by the heat of a dying silver star. My family grew up in that area and had really strong connections to 
um, the land there. And one person who had a really big influence on me when I was young was my grandma. Um, this poem is called Miss Afton. Grandmother's hands shelled thick peas with a slick wet sound. She had fingernails like old fossils and she told tales. We sat in dry clumped prairie dirt, hooded in heat and flies among dusty green sinews of squash and pea plants, and imagined her a girl of the Bear River Valley. The bugs there hummed with purpose. Thick tides of mosquitoes off the river every night washed a tenor over the base of the distant black bees. Cloud cows spread across arid grass like slow splayed fingers. Olive trees reflected sun off silver gray slivers with leaves that twinkled the sleepy green. Grandma spoke of the ranch and how she with her bare feet and gray dress grabbed a garden hose one day and that smooth son of a bitch was a blow snake and you never seen anybody run so fast up a bed of greasewood and into a trailer. Us hill folk pay attention to things, she said, as she squished fresh tomato pickings accidentally under her heel. To an outsider, she didn't seem like much, but the people around her knew if she said there was rain, you believed her, and if she pointed out a weak calf in a herd, he'd be dead with the first cold snap. Later, I saw her in town, resting in a navy blue dress, under the creak of a lazy boy, hidden behind the tang of urine and Formula 409, attended by clear plastic tubes and Coumadin bottles, the prices right humming on a wood panel TV, jammed in the top corner of a light-filled nursing home bedroom. When Grandpa died and they took her here, she just shook her head and said she could use the quiet. She spent all day listening to the old green heater drone on and the echoes of movement. One of the best things about growing up in an area like that, in a very rural, er rural area, is the wildlife, is the animals. A lot of people don't really understand how to find them or see them. And I'm really lucky because that's one of the things that my dad taught me how to look for. You learn how to watch transition areas like, like south facing slopes on hills or like shorelines um, at dawn or dusk and reading scat and finding trails. That's something that, um, has given me a better understanding of the land and uh, more appreciation of a world that's not as empty as it seems. This poem's about spending the summer raising, uh, spending one summer raising quail and chuckers. So um, my old boss had this huge coop, this gigantic thing that he had sectioned off and he was raising game birds like quail and chuckers to, and we would take them up into the draws in the hills and just let them go. Um, not, no, not so much for hunting, but um, he was really uh, trying to turn his land into a wildlife preserve. So this is called quail killing. Fresh death has its own yawning, earthen scent. I drive to work today to smell it. It straddles the corrugated tin of a still bird coop, drapes dry gravel floors, hangs under the bald wooden eaves, stills the wild birds this Thursday morning. My boss says a raccoon got in cornered some quail, chewed off tops of heads. We, speak, we sweep pink strips and light coffee feathers into sticky balls of sand and wetness, scoop mounds of clumped hay slivers and dust into black plastic bags. Our response will be swift, six raccoons in six days, treed, trapped, or holed with buckshot. This, this is my job on this farm, pest removal, weed spraying, tree cutting. I'm not very good at growing things, but I can sure kill them. All those quail left over, those who clung all night to the top net, upside down, wings pulsing for balance, sit in silence. Among Rorschach clots of dust and blood, they require no solace. They do not huddle in packs and hiss. They do not look for answers among their own. They simply breathe and await the heat of noon. Death and injury are handled very differently on a farm than a city. And um, I think that last poem speaks to the death part, but I also wanted to speak to the injury part. My family was farmers, and when a farmer gets hurt, they handle it in a very unique and sometimes frustrating way. Um, and so this is about how farmers handle injuries, how I handle the injury. It's called snake bite. I reach into the trough and feel pain shoot up my arm, uncoiled. There in the calf shed, I draw a sudden breath and stumble back into the feet buckets. 
their white plastic tumbles in hollow headbutt thud sounds, and dust billows from spilled grain with a hiss. My hand throbs and I feel the old animal fear. The deepest one comes in a clean, dry wave. Something bit me. Was that a snake? Is it still in the barn? I list off the snakes I've seen and I don't get far. When my dad was stabbed in the thigh by the left horn of a bull, sitting on an old truck in his own blood and sweating, he said, it hurts and then it doesn't, either way. Only wait around if you have to. I look and the snake is gone, so I grasp the old wood of the gate, oiled and smooth from hands and hide and push. It gives as I lurch forward in rubber boots, moving through sunlit air thick with hay motes and mold. I leave knots of old milk cans and a withered dairy calendar from 1986, gripping my hand in a crusted rag. When fear sits with you, it grows. A new dread comes on, complex now, and coats me like a fungus. Feeds the damp on my brow. What kind of snake was it? How can I find it? How long before the venom sets? The anxiety throbs and hangs. I need this wet fear to dry out and die, but I wonder if it'll be me that dies first. And that realization settles not in a flash of wonder or regret of a life cut short, but of complicity, of, oh well. I walk to the house, boot crunched gravel in my wake. The rag in my fingers pulses with a red, wet, Rorschach blot symmetry. It's a small thing, blossoming slowly. In the end, I make the choice my family passed down to me, wash it out and ignore it. It hurts and then it doesn't, either way. Only wait around if you have to. Um, so now I'm a teacher, I teach at USU. Um, it wasn't really a plan. It swiftly became a calling, and it became something I fought for. I, I stuck around well past my welcome, and for my own benefit. <laughs> but I teach argument, and teaching argument and writing, um, which are very good at making arguments, I like to think. Um, but sometimes you let people win arguments just because you love them. And this is about, this is just kind of an extended metaphor about that. It's called Let Her Win. Sculpt me from sand and brine. It'll be easier then to ruin me. Cast me into the lake of your insistence. Watch me drift into tides, out of cohesion, falling, in, falling into bathial zones and half dark. Into this space I will settle, dust and amber, suffuse and suspended, spanning the deep night, forgetting morning. I will wait as long as it takes, until great seas dry to bald rock and flaked kelp. I will wait until you remember our symmetry, and I'll remember thirst and hunger and wind. I'll know how you contain me, and I'll be glad for it. I have just a couple more. So my dad that I've been writing about is Navajo, and I'm sure several of you have noticed how Navajo I look. Uh, yeah. Very little. Uh, he's actually my stepdad. Uh, he stepped in and married my mom and raised me from before I was born. And for all intents and purposes, he it was my dad. I never met my real dad, and so I took a shot at writing a poem about my real dad. It's called The Only Photo of My Real Father. It looks like it's been held over a fire or left in a car all summer. Sepia cooked to a caramel shade. And in it, you're just sitting there looking sad, a little sideways, like I imagine you always do. Far away blue-eyed gaze and crew-cut military stock on an Air Force base somewhere in the sea in decades past. The clothes are wrinkled like mine. The face looks tired like mine. You lean on a desk in the same way I do when my back aches or when I want someone to notice me. After you left, Mom, put, after you left, Mom put your last picture in a book in the basement. After you left, I was born, and you stayed in a book in the basement. But when my stepdad died, and we sat in the stale room, weeping over his sunken eyes, you came back out and left me the only words I'll ever get from you. Hickam Air Force Base, June 3rd, 1973, with love. Um, so my mom raised me, and my dad raised me, and the TV also raised me. Right? And one of the things I liked on the TV was a little show called Star Trek. So I went there and I tried um, to do that. I think that old sci-fi is so 
misogynistic and cowboy that it just fits right in with my upbringing. Um, and one of the conceits in a Star Trek episode is there's a character called a red shirt, and it's just some extra that they put in there to flesh out the teams that go do things. And you know if he's in a red shirt, he's probably going to die horribly. <laughs> right. So um, I just wanted to explore that. So this is called Star Trek Dead Red Suggestions. Your shirt is the color of blood, a fighter's color, a lover's color. Engineering is no place for such a hero. You with the coiffed hair and rugged smile, intergalactic hustler. Or you would be, except for the duty log. But this is your shot. The dark planet awaits. It hangs in the dead black, wanting conquest, subversion. This is your chance for glory. Shoulder rolls, passionate elbow grabs, green-skinned consorts. Here is some advice for your new position on this team. Number one, follow your captain. He is barrel-chested and he is wise. Number two, avoid the ire of the sharp ear. If an eyebrow lifts, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> Number three, the man in the blue is a doctor. Not a scientist, not a geologist, and not a belly dancer. Number four, in a firefight, keep your head down. Keep your head down. Number five, do not wrestle the amorphous, or the caustic, or the insane. And when you rematerialize on deck, back from your quest, yellow blood on your emblem, the light from three suns preserved in your glowing tan, they will know. Everyone with tall black boots, short skirts, and blonde beehives will know. Everyone with shiny space lovers, chicken wing shoulders, and stringy beetle haircuts will know. They will look at you and say, now there is a real man. Now there is a man. We'll see you soon. I'd like to close with another fable my dad told me another myth. He's from Arizona, and uh, there was a really big historical event in, in Idaho where I grew up called the Beaver Massacre, where a bunch of Shoshone were uh, killed by cavalry. And it really left an imprint on the, the people who lived there. And in a weird way, it sort of became a source of pride. This big thing happened here, and we're a part of it. Even though it's horrible, we don't think about that. We think about this big thing happened here. So because he's Native American, because he's Indian, he's the Indian, it doesn't matter if he's Navajo, if he's not from the area, for all intents and purposes, he's Shoshone, right? So he spends his years there, and he starts to adopt the culture some. He goes to the powwows of the Pocatello, and he makes a lot of Shoshone friends. He really becomes a part of another tribe in a way. And he starts to pick up and relate myths from Shoshone. So this is a Shoshone myth that my dad told me. It parallels in an interesting way with uh, the first one that I really did. It's called Theft of, I'm calling it Theft of Fire. A long time ago, animals and people were the same, and they had no fire in any part of this country. Lizard was lying in the sunshine. He saw an ash, blown by the south wind from a long way off, fall to the ground near him. All the people came over to look at it and wondered where it had come from. They sent Hummingbird up into the sky to find out. They watched Hummingbird fly. Coyote came along and said, I can see him. He's high in the sky. They saw that Hummingbird looked all over to see from where the ash had blown. Coyote watched him as he came down and told the people that there was a fire in the south. Nobody had seen a fire, so they all started to go to the south. On the way, Coyote stationed the different animals at different intervals, left them along the trail. They went, on, they went on until they could see the fire. The people there were having a big celebration and a big dance. Coyote made himself a hair of milkweed string, joined the people, and danced with them. As he danced and sang, he moved too close to the fire and leaned his head over that his hair caught on fire. As soon as it was lit, he ran away. The fire in the camp went out, and the people began to pursue Coyote to recover the fire he had stolen. Coyote ran to the first animal he posted and passed the fire to him. This one ran with it to the next one. And in this way, they passed it along. Every time the pursuers caught one of Coyote's people, they killed him. There were fewer and fewer of them left, but they kept the fire. At last, they came to Rabbit. As he ran with the fire, he caused hail to fall to stop the pursuers. Rabbit cried as he ran. Rat, who was living alone on the top of a big, smooth rock, heard Rabbit crying and went down to meet him. Rat <coughs> took the fire from Rabbit and ran with it to a house. The pursuers gathered all around his house, but could not get into it. 
the fire came from behind and swept through them. They all died from the fire right there. Rat wasn't in his house at all. He took the fire and he scattered it all over the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Russ, and thank you, Case. Let's just give him one more round of applause. <laughs> We're not going to shift gears, we're going to uh, go to open mic now, and it looks like we only have seven readers tonight, um, so I'm thinking we can split it up into a chunk of three readers and a chunk of four readers. Um, will we be able to remember our order that way? Those who signed up? Yeah? I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to have Darlene Turner, then Carly Crosby, and then Moose read to us. Turner. I'm from the Palm Springs area of California and I came up here on the senior uh, program to spend the summer in Logan and I love it here so I know I'm coming back but I've been having too much fun here taking classes and doing uh, hiking and biking and meeting people and seeing all the, the operas and the musicals and it's just 